Okay, so I'm just going to walk us through a simple Bayesian analysis. Here we go. So I am loading a couple of libraries here. We do this, and I've got a cat on my arm here. Um, this is the basic uh, Bayes analysis package. This graphics package works like ggplot, but it's good for uh, Bayes plotting. Shocker, right? Okay, so here's a built-in data set in R called trees. And we make a graph of that, and there's a scatter plot of the size of trees, the girth of trees, and the height. So we see this positive relationship between girth and height. So I want to know what that slope is. <clears throat> I've heard that for these tulip poplar trees, or whatever, I have no idea what kind of tree. I think they're pin. I think they're cherry trees, actually. Anyway, I have learned from the forestry literature some information about the girth and I want to investigate that in my sample size. I'm curious whether that relationship between girth and height is influenced by the kind of landscape they live in. And so I use our usual approach. I just run a linear model, a simple regression model, um, LM height as a function of girth and my data set is trees and I store it in that. And so I run that and then, of course, before I look at any results, I do some, diagno some diagnostic plots. And so I'm going to make uh, four of those right here. And I look at those. And I look at the relationship between fitted values and the residuals. I shouldn't see a relationship there. I look at the fitted values <clears throat> versus standardized residuals. I shouldn't see a relationship there. In the normal QQ plot, I should see these points, that the theoretical quantiles on the, on the x-axis and the standardized residuals on the y-axis. These should follow approximately along this line, and we could quibble about that. And maybe I fix some things, maybe I don't. Um, then maybe I look at the influence of different particular points and see if particular data points um, have a big influence on this and I don't see anything important going on there so I say good and so I come back to my code and I do my regression and I see okay so I've got a <clears throat> the slope of the relationship between girth and height is about 1 or 1.05 there's a certain standard error on it it's significant. I'm stargazing, right? I'm looking for these stars. I'm stargazing. And I find a significant relationship. <laughs> well, duh. Um, yeah, I knew that. But at least I'd, I'd like confidence intervals on it. So I run this next line, line 13. I run that. And here I get confidence intervals on this slope. Okay, that's helpful. I don't know exactly what that means. If I ran this experiment 10,000 more times exactly the same way and I analyze these data an interval thus defined would capture the true relationship you know 95% of the time something like that so let's do a well before we do that what assumptions have we made well <clears throat> remember we're starting out that the um, that this relationship is y as a function of some intercept um, and <clears throat> a slope parameter that I'll call B um, times girth. Um, that Y is a function of those things <clears throat> and we've got noise in there and that the um, error uh, is distributed as a normal random variable um, with a mean of zero and some standard deviation sigma. <clears throat> and um, I'm also assuming that given this, this confidence interval and this p-value, that nothing in the universe is known about the relationship between height and girth. Um, there are other assumptions built into this particular p-value and the thought that went into the study design and all that sort of thing that influences the p-value and renders it um, uh, less than reliable. So let's just estimate the probability um, 
around that slope parameter using a Bayesian approach. So I use, instead of LM, I use BRM, Bayesian regression model, um, and I run this. And the first thing <clears throat> that it does is it, it recodes this, the brooms package recodes this um, in C++, it, it, it recodes, I should say, it recodes this regression model in the STAN language, which is a one of several um, um, packages that are program languages, I should say, languages <clears throat> that do um, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And it requires a lot of iteration and simulation, and it just did that. After, <clears throat> after it recoded it, it ran it, and it did it um, thousands of times and in each of four independent simulations. So a chain is a, is a simulation. We'll get into that later. Anyway, regardless. So I, if I followed the same pattern, I could, do, um, I could run a summary and get some simple diagnostics. And this gives me some diagnostics that I'll explain later, but like a lot of our models, it tells me that this model is, is based on a normal distribution um, with assuming a mean and a standard deviation. The formula of the model is right here. And again, I get an estimate of a girth and um, it right away spits out a credible interval um, upper and lower credible interval. Um, <clears throat> and this is a region of 95% confidence that I can be 95% sure that for these data um, and the population from whence this came that um, my, that the slope is within there. But let's go on because we want to diagnose this. So I'll, I'll scroll down a little bit more. I forgot I did this. So what if, right, as we were saying, um, in our in our session today, Wednesday, the second of February. What if I have some other understanding about this relationship? What what if I take the literature seriously? What what has my model already assumed? And um, my model, my Bayesian model, was I called Fit B. And if I want a prior summary of that model, I can run this command, and this tells me that <clears throat> the um, the slope parameter for girth is a flat prior. That is it's completely uninformative. That it could take any value at all. The intercept, by contrast, um, has a mean that's based on um, Stan observing these data and providing a minimally informative prior um, with a certain number of estimated degrees of freedom and the like. So this is actually giving me a little bit of an informed um, prior, but the slope is completely uninformed. Well, what if I say, I, I think that um, from what I can tell from the literature that that slope should be about one and a half um, not uh, 1.05. Previous literature said that, and I have I have a fair amount of confidence in it. So here in this code, I'm just going to um, run some examples of prior distributions. Actually, let me delete that. Yeah, I want to get rid of that. I want to make it bigger. Um, let's get rid of all these. And let's run this again. So here are possible prior prior distributions, this is my current understanding. And <clears throat> what I was arguing was that based on the forestry literature, um, I really expect a mean of about one and a half and certain some variation around that. So maybe most of the most likely observations come between 0.5 and, and two and a half, but really centered right there around one and a half. Um, another Based on, I don't know, some other literature, um, I know it can't be less than zero because trees don't get bigger around and taller at the same time, at least not these cherry trees. And so I know it's bounded at zero. 
So if I look at this red line, this flat red line, this is a uniform distribution between 0 and 5. And I also know it can't be bigger than 5. Um, that, would be, that would be a really tall skinny tree that would just fall over. And so I know it's bounded between 0 and 5, but I really don't have any idea where it would be in between there. And so this would be an example of a uniform prior with particular bounds. I might also think that, well, I know it's bounded at zero, and <clears throat> but I don't know what the upper bound is, but the mean is right around one and a half. So here's an example of a distribution, a gamma distribution, which has a, a mean that's similar to our normal distribution, but it's bounded at zero. It's in here somewhere, but it's got this longer tail, so it could be much bigger. So these are all examples of weakly informed priors. This black dashed line on the bottom is an example of a flat prior. This is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 100. It's just flat. It could be anywhere, you know, between negative infinity and positive infinity. I guess infinity is a little bit of an exaggeration, but not really much. It's, it's very, very flat. And this is, so this is what Brooms was using to begin with. And I want to come in a little bit more informed. So I'll go ahead and use this normal prior and I will define the prior on my slope this way. It just, it, you know, you can see it. There's a command here called prior and then I say I want a normal distribution with a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 0.5. I tell it what this is applying to, this coefficient associated with the girth variable. I'll name it this. <clears throat> so I'll set that. And then I'll rerun the model, but now the prior, one of the priors in the model, I don't have to specify all of them, <clears throat> but I am going to specify the one for the slope of girth. And so now I have a new prior, and I run that model again. And I just wait. <clears throat> and while Brooms recodes this, this language into the stand language and then runs it in C++, um, some other applications are a little bit smaller, uh, or a little bit quicker, like the RStan ARM program is um, a little bit quicker, but it's done now. And so if I, if I ask for a summary of the priors I use, just to check that, we can see here that my girth prior that I used was indeed what I thought it was. So now, after these models, whether I'm going to diagnose um, this model with the previous model, I want to check MCMC MC chains. And, and this is getting way below the hood, but what this is going to show us are three things. It'll show us some things for the intercept, for the slope, and for the standard deviation of the errors. And these are the actual samples from the posterior distribution. So in our model, we see that the, the estimate, the mean, is right around 1. It's not up here around 1.5, where my prior was, but it's bringing it back down to 1 <clears throat> and giving me this probability distribution for the slope. These funny caterpillar plots are actually evidence that as this simulation is running, Stan is sampling from all over the distribution. You can see here the mean is centered around one, and Stan is sampling above it and below it with a frequency that is reflected by this probability distribution. So this simulation through time, and it, and it runs it, and then it holds things constant, and it runs it again, and it bounces, it bounces around this dis these <coughs> landscapes that Teresa was talking about, if we imagine this hilly landscape of probability distributions, it's bouncing around in that, kind of looking for the hill um, and sort of checking the whole landscape, and it tends to sample one more than other things. And that's what those chains are. We can check other simple diagnostics in a numerical fashion. Um, this R hat <coughs> is an estimate of how different these chains are. These chains that we see on the right hand side are actually four different chains and this R hat is a measure of how variable each one is 
compared to how different the chains are. It's kind of like an analysis of variants in a way. It's comparing the within and among variants of those chains. But we get this estimate of girth down here. Somewhere, um, we can be 95% sure it's between 0.41 and uh, 1.71. We can do that for both models. But let's look at um, different graphical checks on these models. One thing I <clears throat> that's really important in this is thinking that what we've done would apply in the future. And so if our model is a good model, it should we should be able to use our model to simulate something that looks like our data. And that's what we do here. Um, I'm going to make these posterior predictive checks. I'm going to put two graphs up and just look at one at a time. And let's look at this one on the bottom. I think this is fit. Um, this is the second one we did. And this is on this black line is the mean of our data. When we simulated the model, remember, we just had a standard deviation in this model, right? We had some intercepts, some slope, but then we had noise around that. And so if we use the model that we made to simulate more data, then we might come up with different means <clears throat> in our simulated data. And that's what these blue histograms are. These <clears throat> are the means of a thousand or, I don't know, something like a thousand simulated data sets um, from our model. And so we can see that the observed data um, is sitting right on in the middle of all of these simulated data. And you'll notice that these black lines don't quite match up and they, and they should, but in fact, it's because the scales are just a little bit different. So moving on, um, another way to think about this is ask if those are the means, the simulated means. Well, what about the underlying distributions? Here we simulate and plot the entire distribution. So the black line is the density um, plot, or it's kind of like a histogram, except it's a smooth curve, of all of our um, tree heights. And when we simulated new tree heights based on the model we made, we got all of these other possibilities. All of these thin blue lines are other possibilities. And so we're looking to see whether or not our black line, our data, kind of fall within this range of our simulated data. That's what we want to see. Sometimes we find that the, the simulated data don't capture our original data well, and then we have to go back to the drawing board and see what we can do better. Um, what do we want to do next? Well, one of the cool things is that we don't have to get too hung. We don't have to get too hung up about p-values and multiplicity of testing and doing too many tests and doing bond for any corrections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've just got the probability distribution for this model, and so we can look at it. We can hold it up and look at it in any different way. So let's take this silly question I have: What's the probability that the slope is greater than 1.1? So I have, my advisor says that, um, I don't know, there's some test, <laughs> I don't know. Imagine that this slope of this relationship between girth and height, um, some people say should be greater than 1.1 and other people say it should be less. So I'm going to ask a thousand different ways, what's the probability that the slope is greater than 1.1? So I will sample from this distribution. I will simulate data. That's what this is doing up here, samples. And um, that gives me a data frame. Whoop. Oh, environment. Samples. This is now a, the simulation for all of these different models. So a simulated intercept and a simulated slope a simulated intercept and a simulated slope. And every time it's simulating this, these, this model, 
it's esti- it's guessing another intercept, another slope, and it's also estimating, of course, a standard deviation associated with that. We can ignore this log probability over here that's related to the likelihood. So, <clears throat> um, but these are all examples of simulated data. So I want to examine all of my simulated girth values. So I have those now, and I'm going to examine those um, in this graph. And these are, so here I'm, I'm making a graph of the girth from one model. And if I run this line, um, then I'm going to get my second model, fit.b2. And I'm going to make density plots. And here are the two beliefs. This is my, this black line is my uninformed belief when I had uniform priors. But when I went to the literature and um, was able to make um, an informed choice about my prior understanding, then that actually did move. It made my estimate a little bit different because now I'm taking into account the past literature. I'm not pretending that nobody knows anything about the relationship between height and girth of trees. No, I'm bringing that new knowledge into my analysis and saying, okay, now what more can we learn? And what more can what more we have learned is this red distribution here. This is the posterior distribution for the slope of my second model. Okay, so now I want to test this um, idea that what's the probability that that slope is greater than 1.1. Another way to phrase that is what's the proportion of samples, these stochastic samples that are greater than 1.1. So I get the length, I, I count up how many of them there are, and I store that in N, and then I ask R, okay, test whether each of these is greater than 1.1. I sum them up and divide by N, and I find that 43% or 44% of these samples are greater than 1.1. That's a fair amount, right? But that's the answer. I could have asked any question of these data. Here's another way to look at it. I can say, um, let's create test samples, um, test whether um, these stochastic samples minus 1.1 are greater than zero. It's just the same way to, 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 to ask the same, it's a, just a slightly different way to ask the same question, right? So I run that and I make these test samples of testing whether, you know, the stochastic samples are greater than one, are greater than 1.1. And then I can create 90% um, 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 credible intervals using quantiles. And I do that and I boop and I get, um, a test of whether or not it's greater than one. I can use highest probability density intervals. We can talk about what that is. Brooms has this function called hypothesis. And the hypothesis I want to test is that girth is greater than um, 1.1. I can run that and it gives me uh, various output. Anyway, this was a longer video than I thought, but I hope it was um, at least in a little way entertaining.